Okay, so today I'm going to be some, using some words like anarchy and anarchism. These are political words. Um, I will be talking a little bit about crypto economics and stuff later on. So if you just came here to hack and you're not into that stuff, then that's all good. Um, but I feel like there are certain kind of core properties of what we're building that fit ve fairly squarely into those political terms. So we're trying to build stuff where nobody has a monopoly on power, nobody has a monopoly on force. Um, we want to resist coercion, resist hierarchy, promote free association, free people from state power or from coercive institutions. There are also some areas where, depending who you talk to, anarchy means quite different things to different people. Um, left anarchists tend to be all about community and mutual aid. Um, on the right, anarcho-capitalists tend to be more about kind of free markets and economic incentives. But I feel like that all comes together in what we're building. That all comes together in Ethereum, where that's, we need all of that stuff. So we're not the first people to be trying to do this kind of thing. So I thought I'd start by maybe looking at some of the prior art. Look what happened at people before when they tried to, to, to for example, um, free people from coercive institutions and, and coercive states and stuff like that. Um, and, and then I'll get on to, to, to some kind of crypto -econom economic stuff about how we secure our systems. So I'm English, so I'm going to start with the diggers. Um, I feel like the diggers really vibe with Ethereum because um, we, we're, we're in this kind of industrial or post-industrial society, so we're all about building, right? The, sl the slogan is build or, or biddle. The diggers were in an, agriculturist, an agricultural society, so they were about digging. They took over some wasteland in the south of England in a place called St. George's Hill, and they said, anybody can come, we're going to dig and sow, we're going to grow our own food, uh, we don't need rulers, we don't need landlords. The, um, the local lord of the manor disagreed. He organized a gang to... Um, attacked the diggers, destroyed their crops, burned down their cottages. They were also attacked by legal means. So there was, an, there was another revolutionary group around the, the same time called the Ranters. And the Ranters were very sexually liberal, which the, the, the diggers, in fact, were not. Um, but that wasn't enough for the court. The court were apparently persuaded that the, the, the diggers were trouble. People maybe. Uh, more, more people outside England have heard about the, the, the Russian Revolution and the lead up to that. So you had Marx's faction and also Bakunin's faction. And Bakunin and Marx were constantly fighting with each other. Um, Bakunin was an anarchist. Many of the other uh, people who took part in the Russian, Russian Revolution were not. Um, I think you could say that they were co-opted, that the anarchists were co-opted. The statists did not explicitly say that the anarchists were wrong about getting rid of the state. Um, but they said that the state was transitional. So famously, Marx said that the, you know, the state would wither away. Um, I think this is something that we've heard quite often. The dictatorship of the proletariat is just training wheels, right? The, the multi-sig will, you know, will decentralize later. We need the multi-sig for now. We'll get rid of it later. We'll get rid of the central power. But as a transitional, until, until the system matures, we have to have that. Uh, next door in, in Ukraine, the Ukrainian anarchists did a little bit better. They, um, they had a society for several years. Um, ultimately, uh, they were crushed by the Bolsheviks. In Catalonia, during the Spanish Civil War, uh, anarchists, again, had quite a successful society for a while. In those wartime conditions, ultimately crushed by, Fra crushed by Franco. Um, in Manchuria, refugees from, um, from Korea had what you could certainly think of as an anarchist society, ultimately infiltrated by Korean communists, their leaders assassinated, and then crushed by the Imperial Japanese Army. So we've got this whole list of what temporarily appear to be successful, but nobody need, manages to last very long. And Hakim Bey, writing in the 80s and the 90s, starts to suggest that successful anarchist movements are temporary. That although we might like to you know, create an anarchist society that, that's long running, what really works is when somebody um, creates a movement that does something and accomplishes something and then kind of melts away. So he says this, the TAS, what he calls the temporary autonomous zone, 
is like an uprising which does not engage directly with the state, a guerrilla operation which liberates an area of land of time of imagination and then dissolves itself to reform elsewhere or else when before the state can crush it. Now, Satoshi also actually gives you these kinds of vibes some of the time. So, um, an early Bitcoin skeptic said to Satoshi, you will not find a solution to political problems in cryptography. And Satoshi replies, yes, but we can win a major battle in the arms race and gain a new territory of freedom for several years. For several years. And this is something that, that I think the modern Bitcoin, Bitcoin um, ideology would really not like the sound of, right? You, you often hear people quote the sentence before this and the sentence after this, but they, they hardly ever quote this sentence with the several years part. Um, and I feel like when we were doing Bitcoin early on, before the block size wars, back in those days, it was something that would have made a lot more sense to us, in that you know, we were trying to create a circular economy. The, the, the slogan wasn't hodl, it was spend and replace. Um, where, whereas now it's all about, you know, you're gonna hodl uh, the Bitcoins until the grave and then you're gonna pass them on to the next generation. But while all this is going on, oh, okay, so, 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 so just, just to kind of summarize what, what we've done so far, my, my little chart here. So I've put ambition on the vertical axis and longevity on the horizontal axis. Up the top, we've got the people I've just been talking about, the Korean anarchists, the Ukrainian anarchists, um, the Catalonian anarchists, the diggers. Um, lower down, I've put kind of intentional communities because there are a bunch of kind of anarchist, sort of an anarchist leading kind of slightly um, monastic lives who don't really interact very much with society but manage to carry on quite a long time. And then right down the bottom right, I've put lunch. Um, what, what I mean by this is that when you're having lunch, nobody is in control, right? Nobody is, is dictating how long everybody should speak for, who should speak next. People just talk and they interrupt each other. It's absolute anarchy. And yet this has persisted for millennia. So, while all this is going on, the free software movement show up and seize the means of production. Th this is another, another thing where I'm, I'm just gonna, since I'm nearly 50, I, I'm gonna do like kids today. I don't think young people today appreciate the enormity of what the free software movement accomplished. Like, like back in sort of e even, you know, the, the 90s, even the early 2000s, free software felt like a real niche thing. It was a hobby thing, you know? Whereas now it's running everything. It's running the servers, it's on your little IoT things, it's on your phone, it's everywhere. And everything we do is based on free software. So how did the free software movement do so much winning? Um, there were a few effective habits they, said they had. One was they had fairly limited goals. So they're about freedom for software, that, that's about it. Um, they had a very solid legal base. So like the diggers, the, the were legal attacks against the free software movement. Um, there were, were, for example, the SCO lawsuits um, where somebody tried to, um, to sue users of Linux um, on spurious copyright grounds. Um, and that was quite a well-funded, well-resourced uh, litigation. They built very strong shelling fences. So in free software, there is free software and there is non-free software. If you do not provide all of the freedoms that are required for your users, you are doing non-free software. Um, if you are using the business software license, if you are MetaMask and you are using some license that does not allow people to make a, a fork and to use it successfully, you are doing non-free software. And people from the non-free software movement will tell you not to use that software. Um, but okay, but, but all this said, you can still, if you want to, kind of co-opt or attack a, a, a free software project. Um, if someone puts a gun to my head and wants to take over Reality or ETH, I'm, like, I'm, I'm not gonna die for, for the software, I'm sorry. In a lot of cases, you can just show up and start submitting patches to a project and then ask the maintainer if they'd like to take over and they'll be like, thank God, just take it off my hands. So, so you can definitely attack or co-opt free software, but that doesn't matter because we have the ability to fork. And this is the fundamental free software movement cheat code that secures everything. Um, so forking solves your internal governance problems. Um, it doesn't matter if, if you have kind of a factional dispute, maybe just someone in the project's being a dick. The worst thing that, can hap that has to happen is just that the, the team splits off and somebody else uh, runs with the software. Um, and it, run it roots around att attacks and co-option. Co so if you buy the company that is developing some software, uh, and then start to do nasty things with it, then somebody else always has the ability uh, to take over the software and to make another version. 
and by the way, this, this is what the four freedoms are all about. This is the ability um, that free software gives you that MetaMask, for example, does not give you. So back to our chart, we've got the free software movement. They're a little bit further up and to the right. So this is what, where human freedom is extending into a place where it's never been before. We have a little bit more ambition, not as much as ambition of, uh, as the diggers, but still a little bit more ambition, and quite a lot of longevity. Okay, so I feel like we can kind of take this then in two directions. So we can listen to Hacking Bay and we can embrace transients when we're building systems. Um, or we can say, what do we have to do to try to get further to the top right and embrace permanence? Um, and I'm not actually totally confident about which one we should be doing here, but I thought I'd explore a little bit um, how, how this stuff works. So with our base layers, with our Ethereums, our Bitcoins, um, we have what I think we're aiming to make very permanent systems. Um, so if you have a balance in Ethereum, even if it's an address that's, for example, sanctioned by, by OFAC, then nobody can freeze that, and you can always move those funds. If somebody tries to prevent people from moving your funds, to prevent you from moving your funds from an Ethereum address, then if necessary, we will fork Ethereum to fix it, right? So right now with Tornado Cash, there are times when if you send a transaction, it may not get into the next block, or it may not even get into the next two blocks, but ultimately you can move your money. Um, if that starts to happen at the validator level, so we get to a point where you can't even um, get any transaction into a block, because if you do, that block will get reorged out, then that's when we're gonna do, I hope and believe, uh, social slashing. We'll do a fork of Ethereum, which um, probably punishes the stakers who did that, and allows people to carry on non-censored. Now, that was the base layer. On the application layer, things are a little bit different. So one of the things we try to build is permanent, ungoverned applications um, that we'll never need to mess with and that will always work. So for example, the first version of the um, Ethereum name service, um, Ether ENS version one, had no governance parameters. It was just code. Um, so there, w there was an auction mechanism to decide how much it should cost to buy a domain. There was no need to renew a domain, so the, the contract would have worked as it was, just completely immutable with no need for governance. Um, then in version two, the team figured that that wasn't actually working that well because a lot of domains were getting squatted. Um, so they wanted to put in kind of a reasonable renewal fee that ordinary users would be able to afford um, and, and that would make things difficult for, for squatters. But once you do that, to make a reasonable renewal fee, you either say, okay, it's gonna be like five or $10, now you need an oracle, so now you need governance. Um, or you say, we're gonna continually adjust these parameters to make sure that it's a reasonable uh, price, and then you also need governance. So then you ended up with like a governance down, all this stuff. A lot of other apps that we have, and this is quite a success successful pattern, will do what Hacking Bay would have suggested and embrace transients. So if you're building a DAO where people are pooling assets for some purpose, a really good way to do it is to use rage quit. So you set the thing up so that whatever governance decisions you have, you can always pull your assets out. And then people can, can either pull them out of your, of your thing and then put them in another thing that does the same, uh, serves the same purpose, um, or they can just give up altogether. Um, we, ha we have the same kind of model with stuff like Uniswap, um, although they're licensed criminals, but, um, but, but their, their contract model is, um, for a contract upgrade, you made version one of Uniswap. When the team wanted to, they made version two of Uniswap, and then people had a choice to just pull out of version one and put their assets into version two. Um, and that worked because it's a use case where you don't really need permanence, right? You, you can, if you're trading, then your money only needs to be in the, in the contract for an instant. Um, and it, if you're doing liquidity provision, then you're still able to get out fairly quickly. So we've ended up with this world of slightly, sort of slightly bizarre subset of finance consisting of a lot of trading, which is ki kind of instant and transient, um, a little bit of sort of lending, where what we mean by lending is maybe not what most people mean by lending, um, and, and is also quite transient, it's also quite easy to pull your money out. Um, and obviously a lot of Ponzi schemes which are, um, which are perfect because they're transient by definition. Um, but 
for a lot of kind of real world financial cases, you really want to have permanence. So for example, if you're mortgaging your house, you don't want the bank to rage quit halfway through and say you've got to sell the house or give, you know, give me your money back. Um, or if you're trying to make a contract in die and you're promised 100 die in 10 years, that's not going to work if die has to pull the emergency settlement lever part way through and all the die get turned back into the original collateral. Um, so for that, we need permanence. So, so one, one option, seriously, one option is just not to do all that other stuff. That's maybe what Hacken Bay would suggest. But the other thing we can do is try to get ourselves some truth and justice. Because um, that's what we need. To, to make permanent systems, we need truth and justice on the chain. We need to be able to say, for example, somebody plans to upgrade this contract, is that upgrade malicious? Um, or di you know, did this price fee break, what should we replace it with? Um, so we need what Eigenlayer are now calling intersubjective work. When you have a massive TVL, you get to just make up new words. Um, and they've got inter intersubjective work. So intersubjective work means that everybody knows, or most people know, there is a general subjective understanding in the world of something, but the blockchain doesn't know it. So we may all know that the contract is malicious, but we need to somehow tell that to the blockchain in a way that isn't exploitable. Okay? So how do we do that? How do we get truth and justice to the chain? One thing people often think of is token voting. So we think we've got a bunch of token holders. They are fairly well aligned because they want their tokens to be worth something. So they are going to want this contract to work successfully. So we can get them to govern it. We can get them to do things like upgrades. We can get them to tweak parameters. This is rather nasty. So the, the first problem is a very crude attack on these systems is a 51% attack. You buy half the tokens and then you have uh, majority voting power and you can do whatever you like. Um, there are also kind of more subtle attacks involving bribery and we do see quite a bit of bribery or increasingly we're seeing bribery um, on token voting systems. Um, and, and bribery is bad because you don't necessarily need all that much money compared to the assets that the contract is holding to, to, to pull off a bribery attack. Um, if I have one vote it's likely that my one vote is not actually going to be the one that causes the uh, attack to succeed or fail. So if I take a bribe to attack a, a, a token voting governance system, then I may get that money and it may not cost me anything at all because the other 51% uh, may not take the bribe. And conversely, if I resist taking the bribe, then maybe the rest of the token voters are going to take the bribe and they un I end up with the system broken and also with um, you know, not, not getting the bribe I could have got. Um, so the, the costs of the attack are kind of socialized while the, the revenue from the bribe is privatized, so, so that doesn't work well. Um, we could try to use democracy, and democracy is great on kind of closed membership systems where we know who is going to be participating um, and we have some kind of like common interest or trust relationship with them. Um, where it's not so bad, so good, is if you've got open membership and anybody can show up and join. Um, even if you have a very good kind of proof of personhood type of system so that you can tell who is one person, it's still crypto-economically rather nasty and in a sense even worse with to than token holding, uh, than, than token voting, because people who are participating may not have much skin in the game. Um, so uh, uh, an attack like this from history would be the 1980s building societies in England. Um, there were all these kind of community banks that came out of the co cooperative movement in the 19th century. And they worked on the principle of one member, one vote. So if you put in 100 pounds into the building society, then you would get a vote and you would have as much power as somebody who had 10 million pounds in the building society or who had a mortgage with the building society. And what happened was that people discovered that they could put 100 pounds in the building society, get the membership voting, and then participate in a governance attack. So what happened was that all these building societies got turned into regular shareholder corporations. The people who had, had only had 100 pounds then got massive payouts of, you know, in pre-crypto days, just enormous sums like, you know, 10,000 um, pounds. And all these, all these building societies got hit. And once this happens with one system, it becomes really contagious because all of the relatively honest people who would not be participating in these attacks will see it get, getting done and getting uh, people getting, getting away with it. And then they'll feel like chumps because they're not doing it as well. 
So then people think, okay, let's do token voting, but let's put in some incentives, right? Let's reward the people who vote honestly, and let's punish the people who vote dishonestly. Um, but the problem now is we have to decide who to reward and who to punish. And a successful attacker can actually flip these incentives around. Because if I can convince you that I can wield 51% of, uh, of the vote for my attack, then your incentives are now to go along with your attack so that you don't, with my attack, so that you don't end up, end up in the mi minority. So there is, there is attacks called kind of P epsilon attacks, which I'll, I'll link to in my, my, my final slide, um, where you make a commitment that if the proposition just passes, then you're gonna get paid the bribe, but if it passes by like 80%, then you're not gonna get paid the bribe. And if I do that, then in theory, I can get away with a bribery attack um, with easy, for, for, without even having to pay any money at all. All I have to do is to prove that I could um, do, the, do the bribing. So the solution to all this is the free software movement's cheat codes. If we can fork our underlying system, then which system is chosen is not something that is decided by like a token, right? It's not something that's decided by counting something. It's not decided by anything that can be um, taken over by a more powerful attacker. So if we fork Ethereum, the, the winning version of, e of Ethereum is the one that people want to use. It doesn't matter, it's not a matter of having the majority of the stake, it's a matter of having, the, having more users who want to use it. Um, so Martin Kopelman, a long, long time ago, when Gnosis chain, when Gnosis was still a, um, a prediction market platform, um, had this idea for the ultimate oracle where Ethereum would be forked over truth and justice. Um, Justin Drake had this idea of putting like price feeds into Ethereum consensus um, so that just for that one data point of the Ether to USD uh, exchange rate, we would have um, this very strong um, security that we were getting the correct data and that we could fork if necessary. I can layer version one. I don't know if the, if the idea was to use Ethereum, use Ethereum forks to, uh, to backstop it. Um, the design only makes sense to me if it was, but I'm not sure. Um, if it had become too big to fail, then plausibly that's what happened. So they got a lot of pushback and they ended up not doing that. So if we can't do that, what we can do is we can try to put the forking mechanic on chain in our own contracts. And a really good example of this is Augur. It's now kind of a, it's kind of a, a dead prediction market. Um, I'll link it at the end to a talk I did at DAPCON that gives a lot more detail about how Augur works. So what Augur's doing is their problem is they've got a prediction market and they're trying to settle the prediction market. So they need the truth about who won this election, for example. And what they do is if something escalates far enough, they're gonna have token holders commit to one side or the other. So the token holders will say Trump won the election or Biden won the election. And then in a dispute, the entire system is going to be cloned. So now there are gonna be two versions of the prediction market. Um, one of them is going to be committed to a lie, and the other is going to be committed to the truth. Nobody actually wants to use a prediction market committed to, to lies, because the whole point of the prediction market is that if you're right, you want to get paid. Um, so what should happen is that the uh, tokens in the lying version are worthless, and the tokens in the truth-telling version are worth, we hope, as much as the original prediction market before we did the fork. Okay, so just kind of, kind of wrapping up, there are three paths that we can take when we're building stuff. Um, we can design for ungoverned permanence, like ENS version one. Um, I still think we could do this more than we actually are. Um, it's, it, it's, it's really what people thought of it originally, I think, when they thought about smart contracts, and it does sometimes work, so if you can do that, great. If you can't try to design for tra transients, if you're making a DAO, make sure you have rage quit. Um, if you're not making a DAO, try to make sure that, um, that, that it's something that, easily, that people can easily exit. Um, and that also make, allows you to do these very nice um, kind of Uniswap style contract upgrades. And finally, if you need permanence, what you really need to look at is a, is a forking mechanic. So um, I've put a bunch of links up here. They're really good links. I was think, I was, earlier I was thinking maybe I should just not do the talk and just have everybody read these quietly, because they're so good. Um, the, I, I've got some stuff about um, Backstop that I'm building, which is a layer two that we fork. Um, I've got a talk I gave on Augur, um, thing from Vitalik on uh, P Epsilon attacks, and then loads of history on the Catalonians and the diggers. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Edmund, for this talk. Uh, are there any questions?
Hi, yeah, um, c could you explain the, how the prediction market solves or, or tackles the, the problem with a 51% bribery attack again? Because I, I didn't quite get that part. Yeah, okay, what, so. What is the I, prediction on? That's great, how, yeah, okay, how, how, does, how, does, how does Org do it? And, and the, there's, there's lots of detail in, in, the, in the talk I gave at, at DAPCOM, but, um, but fundamentally there are, there are kind of two ways to do it. One, one is, if you're just doing, if you're, if you're um, governing your own token, Let's imagine that we're taking all the bets in our token. There's a dispute. Um, when there's a dispute, first of all, we get everybody who has an, op an opinion to commit to one side or the other, right? So let's say that some of the people have committed to the truth and some of the people have committed to a lie. What we then do is we clone the prediction market into two. So one version is committed to the truth and the other version is committed to the lie. The great thing about this is the blockchain doesn't know, have to know who's right, yeah? Both, both sides have got their prediction market. Anybody can use either prediction market. The liars are all now, all have the tokens in the lie universe. The truth tellers all have the tokens in the, in the true universe. So it doesn't actually matter. Even if 99% of the token holders went into the lie universe, nobody's gonna use the lie universe because it's a garbage prediction market. So, so, so that's the, the wonderful, wonderful thing about it. And there's a similar move now in Eigenlayer version two, um, which is also quite a cool design. Um, so, so that's if you just want to use your own token. Um, the tricky thing about the problem that Augur has is that they didn't want to use their own token, they want to use Ether and DAI. And if you're going to use Ether and DAI, you've then got to somehow govern which side are the Ether and DAI going to go. Um, so they do this by saying, okay, which of these two sides gets the most tokens moving? Um, but that's only secure up to 51%. Like, it's more secure than token voting, because it's at least secure for 51%. Um, but if you're trying to manage more value, let's imagine that you've got $100 million of, um, of, of bets on Donald Trump, saying that Donald Trump won the election, and then you've got a market cap of te $10 million, then it's still uh, incentive compatible for somebody to buy up the half of the auger tokens for $5 million, missettle the market, and then claim their, their bet in Ethan and I. So then, then I can layer do this thing where they have a trick with insurance, but it has basically the same problem. What we're doing in Backstop is we're trying to get people to use native tokens as much as they possibly can. Um, and rather than having this single token, we're making a layer two system where anybody can make whatever token they want or NFTs or whatever they want and try to deploy those assets on the forkable token. And that way you have this very extreme free software movement style forkable security rather than the 51% attackable economic security. Uh, here one. You were using a word, we, 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 we. <laughs> I was thinking, who the fuck are we? Uh, and in that sense, I'm interested in the, uh, the event uh, motto is identity crisis. And within many social movements that you showed, there were uh, highly exclusionary to extended act external actors, let's say. And how you define your comrades within this uh, scene, let's say. Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a very fair question. Um, I don't know. How, how, do, how do you define, I mean, so how do, how do, how do you define the, the, the people who you think are doing the same thing, you know? I mean, I mean I've, 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 in this talk, I tried to use we in terms of ge kind of generally <laughs> people who come to West Berlin, um, but obviously a lot of people come to West Berlin and everybody's free, free to show up. Um, so yeah, that, that's the best I can do, I'm afraid. I, I don't have a clear definition for who is in a movement. And where, where this becomes important is it's not entirely clear, where, and, and also where, where I start to think maybe the permanence doesn't work and you have to be transient, is it's not really clear to me that, for example, let's, let's say, so, so with Ethereum, I said we will fork Ethereum if it's um, attacked so that you can't take um, tornado cash transactions, right? Um, now, not all of the e Ethereum users want to do that, right? Some Ethereum users would rather it didn't have tornado cash transactions. And increasingly, Ethereum tokens are held by EDIFs, ETFs and like TradFi institutions. A lot of what we have on the chain is like um, stable, backed stable coins that are, that are backed by uh, regulated, for example, US institutions. Um, so it's very possible that the, the, the Ethereum will not like, like, I think of Ethereum as a, as a system which will be committed to not having censorship, but that's social and that may not persist. Um, 
if it doesn't persist, we can always make a fork. Well, the, the people who agree it should not be censored can always make a fork and, um, and honor their guarantee with respect to their own chain. But if you've got the money in Tornado Cash, then if our chain is not very valuable, then you're still kind of screwed. Um, I increasingly, what I've been wondering is whether, uh, after sort of Bitcoin and Ethereum, is whether these systems do actually have like a, a life of like seven or eight years before they get co-opted and then you should move on to the next thing. I don't know. But anyway, I, we're not yet late there yet with Ethereum. I'm still very hopeful. Uh, so the thing is that uh, we can talk about decentralization in this setup when we're sitting in a Western country, but if you talk about like countries like India, China, you know, like living day-to-day -day life is uh, very difficult and people are not really aware of like political decisions and you know, the repercussions that they are gonna have. So when we, let's say we extrapolate this and we say that the world becomes decentralized, how do you see that happening? Like, how do you envision it? Like, what does it look like? Do people really participate in it? Like the general population? Or is it like the handful of people with purpose who are doing it and then it's the same thing all over again? Yeah, good question. I mean, if there's going to be one, I, it, okay, the, the world has a lot of different systems. Different people participate in those systems and people participate in systems that reflect their values. Ethereum has been made by, you know, people with a certain set of values. I don't know if those values will persist and will be usable by the entire world or not. Um, I don't know if systems that we build will be useful to everyone in India or if they will need to build their own systems. So that's not a very satisfactory answer, but that's all I've got. 